Welcome to our next talk from the SAP Employees for Climate. We are very happy to have Lars Fischer with us for our two-day talk who, that will be also recorded and later be made available via SAP Media. And if you have questions in the Zoom webinar, you can ask your questions in the question and answer tool or in the chat. And I will repeat the question later to uh, Mr. Fischer. Um, and we have also some presence here in the room and you can also ask your questions later after the talk of Mr. Fischer. And we are very happy to have you with us and I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and listening to me. Uh, first, I am originally a chemist and I am editor at Spectrum der Wissenschaft, which is part of Springer Nature, a science publisher in Heidelberg. As I said, I'm a chemist originally, but in my job as editor and science journalist, I regularly write about climate change, about climate sciences, about geosciences, and one topic uh, I regularly meet in my function is a question of extreme weather, of extreme weather disasters in the context of climate change. So this is the title of my lecture. Is this still normal? I can answer that up front. No, it's not normal anymore at all. So extreme weather, human agency and a changing climate. This means at first I will go into the question whether any weather event is actually connected to climate change. As you, as you know, uh, the history of mankind is dotted with weather disasters, with drought, with rainstorms and so on. There have always been extreme weather events that were extremely destructive, extremely disruptive. So uh, if we see an extreme weather event today in the changing climate, how do we know if this is actually climate change or whether this uh, the weather event is just something that happens, should happen, as we all know. Um, and the science that answers this question is called attribution science, attribution of extreme weather to climate change. Uh, that is the first part of my talk. I will explain to you um, I will give you a brief outline, how is it done, how attribution of extreme weather work. And the second part is, what does it mean? What, what, how does it help us to know, oh, uh, our city was devastated by rainfall. Now we know this happened in part because of climate change. How does this help us? So what are we doing? with the knowledge, what are we doing with the information we are getting from attribution science and how are we going to work with the changing climate with extreme weather. So that's the human agency part, what are we doing? Because extreme weather is not just about climate, it's about us, about humans, because weather is just something that happens. It's a physical process and a weather disaster only happens when humans are impacted by definition. So weather disasters always are connected with human agency. That's the second part. And the third part is where I will argue that knowing about extreme weather, that the first part, the uh, knowledge how climate change impacts extreme weather and the knowledge about how we go on about it, how we deal with extreme weather, all have a very distinct meaning 
uh, about how we can deal with climate change. So in the end, I will come full circle and tell you about what extreme weather means for climate change. So, okay, for the first part, extreme weather in the context of climate change. What you see here is a relatively simple sketch about how, how climate change shifts the weather. This shows, uh, well, two normal distributions because every, every parameter of weather, be it temperature, be it wind strength or the frequency of hurricanes or rainfall follows uh, in first approximation, a normal distribution. So we have this Gaussian normal distribution for nearly every parameter of weather, of climate. And when the climate change, this normal distribution changes. This is what we are seeing here. Uh, actually, in most parameters, I try to, be, to sit here, uh, the normal distribution also broadens. I'm not entirely sure how that happens. I'm, I personally think it's connected to, to ongoing change, to climate forcing, but those are the two effects that climate change has on any one weather parameter. So uh, please note that this normal distribution is an abstract. It applies to every parameter, every single parameter that we want to measure, not only to temperature. But uh, normally we have this uh, we have the distribution depicted as showing temperature because global warming is mostly about temperature, but we can depict nearly every parameter uh, in this way. And it's not always shifted to the right. For example, for example, global warming seems to decrease average global wind speeds. So uh, the new climate distribution will be pushed to the left. So uh, the principle is that we get this shift in a statistical distribution. And we are talking about statistics here. So when we are talking about extreme events, we are talking about the edges of these distributions. These distributions of frequency distribution, events in the middle are occurring relatively frequent and relatively frequent e uh, events are normal and not extreme. So we are talking about events at the edge of those distributions, which are very rare. So we are doing statistics with very rare events and everybody who knows anything about statistics knows that statistics, doing statistics with rare events is very difficult. And uh, well, uh, uh, keeps us on our toes. So um, extreme weather in the context of climate change, what we know about extreme weather, what we see is, that, well, normal weather is normal, but extreme weather is increasing very rapidly. It seems to increase very rapidly, and this is actually a real effect. So uh, extreme weather conditions are increasing much more strongly, are increasing much faster than any, any other conditions for a very simple statistical reason. Because those uh, extreme events are at the outside of these distribution, in the corner of this triangle, tri triangle uh, what we see is we have a strange weather event at the edge of the old climate. And now the new climate is shifting over we see not just an increase, uh, as you can as you can see here in this graphic, but what 
unfortunately, it's not just depicted so well in this graphic, but uh, what we also have is that the slope of our distribution is always increasing. So when we shift the new climate in increments, the, uh, the frequency of any one event of any one point on the x-axis is also increasing, but with any increment, it's not only increasing, but the increase itself is increasing because of the slope. Because of the slope uh, going, uh, going ever steeper, the further the climate distribution shift. I hope this, uh, hope this was clear, but that's the reason, that's the reason why extreme events, the frequency of extreme events is increasing so sharply and much more sharply than anything else than normal events and so on. So this is very important. Um, extreme events are getting more and more frequent and more and more damaging. So, uh, so how do we know, or how, how did it start? How did it start that scientists tried to attribute an extreme event to climate change that, that uh, scientists could say, okay, this event was actually in part caused by climate change. And until about 20 years ago, this was deemed impossible to say because these events are so rare and so difficult to, to calculate statistically that uh, people thought it was simply impossible to make such an attribution. But in 2004, the whole field started with a paper I show here about the European heat wave in 2003, where I believe 30,000 people died in a, in a very strong heat wave in Central Europe. And there was this paper that uh, made this calculation and came to, to the conclusion that the likelihood of this heat wave has been at least doubled by climate change. So that was the initial, the initial paper, the initial start uh, uh, of climate change attribution of extreme weather attribution. So, okay, let's let's get to how this works. Actually, it's a bit simple. Conceptually, it's it's pretty simple because, uh, well. What we, what we do is we try to find these curves for the uh, parameter, for the climate parameter that we want to watch, like oh, rainfall over a certain period or the length and intensity of drought and so on. And so our normal distributions in the old climate, so our normal distribution in the new climate. So we want to find the difference between the normal distribution. And what we do is we run climate models. So in, on one hand, we run a climate model in the modern climate with climate change, with carbon dioxide and uh, waste and so on. And we compare that with model runs for the old climate. So what we do is we let models run and run and run and run. Climate models like 200, 400 runs. So this is very, uh, very computing time intensive, of course. So that's another another reason why this field is really new, uh, because it was simply technological, not possible to do these kind of calculations at that scale. So, uh, so that's what we do. We let the models run in the old climate here in blue, red, uh, new climate in red. We get a 
uh, some kind some kind of distributions of certain scenarios of events that are different or more or less alike. And then we take a statistical model and fit our statistical model, our curve, to the data we get. And so we can actually compare the statistics we get uh, from the model runs in the old climate and in the new climate. And so we can take our event that we try to, to analyze and we can say, okay, in the old climate, this would have, this would have happened, let's say every 200 years. And in the new climate, we have a frequency of maybe every 50 years. So that's the basic and very simple idea behind uh, climate change, uh, extreme weather attribution science. So uh, as you all know, it's not that easy with computer models. Uh, there are, uh, well, uh, there are a number of catches. I will get to that later, but the first thing is what do we do with this information? Of course, as a journalist, the first thing that will happen is, okay, there was an extreme weather event, there was a storm, a very destructive storm, and then there will be a study, and I, as a journalist, will write, okay, this event was 20 times as likely in the new, uh, because of climate change, uh, it is 20 times as likely today as it was in, let's say, the pre-industrial climate or in the climate like, 30 years ago. So, so this is the first thing, communication. People are communicating climate change, uh, climate science. So in the hope that at some point, someone will get the message that we have to do something. Uh, didn't happen so far, but uh, one can but hope. Uh, but the next thing, of course, we know or we learn from our model that a certain climate event with a certain impact occurs not, not just every 200 years or every 100 years, but let's say every 20 years or every 15 years. When we talk about a destructive event every 200 years, we will have like a normal, a normal structure, a normal building has a lifetime of about 40 years. So uh, when we have a likelihood that this building will not be hit by, a, by a, such a, an event, we will plan very differently. There will, there will other margins of safety, other calculations, cost calculation, when we say, okay, we have a destructive event of this type that will occur every 10 years or every 20 years, it will likely occur at least once or twice during the lifetime of this building. This is a very important point because all this goes not just for buildings, but for infrastructure, for uh, public infrastructure, for, uh, for public planning, for business planning, especially, uh, especially in, in agriculture. In agriculture, we need to know certain events happen or drought happens every, every 20 years or every 100 years. People have to plan, people, people have to, to calculate. So there is a uh, uh, planning for risk in building and agriculture. Of course, we need to plan for these events uh, in preparedness and early warning. Uh, maybe we will need to do hurricane drills in Hamburg at some point, who knows? Uh, but if we find that every 20 or 50 years a hurricane will actually hit Hamburg, we will have to 
think about it. So uh, that that's that's a very important point because it's not just that known events are getting stronger, but certain extreme events occur somewhere somewhere else where they have not occurred before. Think about uh, the Hurricane Otis that hit Acapulco recently, a huge disaster that was uh, it didn't get as much attention at the moment because it was in the global south, but it was a huge disaster. It was the first Category 5 hurricane hitting this 2 million people city ever. So this is an, an important point. Where will such events strike uh, in the next 20, 30 years? Where do we need to prepare? Uh, of course, the next, the next thing, the, uh, the important thing, another important thing is uh, preparing for recovery. So if we know a city will be damaged or destroyed, we need to plan how to rebuild, how to rebuild the economy, how to support vulnerable populations, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's not just about communication, but uh, extreme weather attribution, the, the knowledge that climate change increases certain kinds of extreme weather in certain ways has a huge impact uh, on how we deal with this kind of weather. So, so this is a very young science, a very young field of work, but uh, it's very, very important for the future. So um, let's get to the challenges of attribution science. Uh, there was, after 2003, everybody was totally happy saying, oh, we can tell the climate change impact on heat wave. But seven years later, there was a, a hugely destructive heat wave in Russia in 2010. So everyone went and tried to, to find out what was the contribution of climate change to this Russian heat wave in 2010. And the result was a bit surprising. Uh, there was one paper that concluded this heat wave was completely natural. Another paper nearly at the same time, on the other hand, concluded uh, it was, it had become five times more likely because of climate change. So uh, there was a there was a bit of a struggle which interpretation was right, which which interpretation was wrong. But in the end, it turned out that those two papers looked at different things. So uh, the first paper that found there was no external contribution actually looked at the strength of the heat wave. How long, how strong was that heat wave? So, and it found that it was all explainable by internal variation of the climate. There was a certain weather pattern, a blocked omega pattern, if you, you've probably heard that before, uh, and it occurs pretty, pretty regularly in that area. And if it stays for a certain length, it gets, it creates a massive heat wave. So they said it was natural. But the other paper specifically looked at the frequency and not at the strength. They looked at the likelihood that a, a heat wave would exceed a certain threshold. And that's a completely different thing. And I show this paper as an example because it shows a very important point, namely that we need to decide beforehand what we need to look at, what we are talking about, what we want to attribute. Do we want to at attribute the frequency, the, uh, the pure likelihood of exceeding the threshold, or do we want to, to attribute 
uh, certain strains of a heat wave for climate change. So and that was a uh, that was quite a bit of a shock after everyone was happy that uh, that you could attribute heat waves to climate change. Then a bit later on, there was a huge row about these interpretation, and of course, a climate denier jumped in and and looked at one paper that said, "Oh, it was all natural," and so on and so on and so on. So, so uh, scientists were not happy about it, but there was a, a learning experience here uh, that there are huge challenges to attribution, to the attribution of extreme weather to the changing climate. Now, and one problem is, of course, the quality of the models and uh, the quality of the models depends on observational data. And when we want to model average temperature around the globe or in huge regions and so on, our climate models are very, very accurate, absolutely accurate. Really, really great what these models can do because we can validate them with a lot of observational data. But when we look at extreme events, rare events. As I said, we are doing statistics about very rare events. And this gets difficult. We get less observational data. We can validate the models not as good. We don't know so well how the models work. So uh, that's a huge problem even today and a huge challenge for the future. Uh, then what I said about the Russian heat wave, uh, what parameters are we actually looking at? Are we looking at the duration of a heat wave? Are we looking at the temperature at the highest two or three days? That's where the impact is probably worse, the worst impact. So uh, that's a question not just uh, not just uh, from a scientific point of view, but an impact point of view. So when when we are discussing an extreme event, a destructive event, we need to know what was so destructive, what had this massive financial human impact, and then we need to model, especially this parameter, uh, and then we need to look at the model, what model can reproduce this event, what statistical models can we use. I think most of you listening here will be at least a bit versed in statistics, and you will know that it will make a huge difference which model you choose. So, so that's an active, active field of research with statistical models behind attribution uh, science. And the last point is we can model the likelihood of a climate event, of a weather event, but what can we actually say about the damage, about the human cost, about the financial cost? And that's a completely different, it's a completely different issue that's not, not really well solved today. So, uh, at, at the moment, we have a lot of challenges here. So if you read about climate change attribution, uh, extreme weather attribution, keep in mind that there are many unsolved questions that there, that there can be disputes about statistical models that can be disputed about uh, quality of data, uh, quality of models, so uh, this is not at all an exact science. Climate extreme weather attribution is still a bit of a trial and error at the moment. And of course, there are extreme events that cannot be modeled. For example, tornadoes. Tornadoes are so small that a tornado can be 
as large as this building, but when you have a weather model, they are grid based. And this grid can be five by five kilometers. When you have a five by five kilometer grid, you can model events that have scales of 200 meters or so. So there is a hard limit today what these models, what these climate change attributions can do. So there are many, many blank areas. And we saw that recently. Recent extremes have been a lot worse than anticipated. Uh, you will have heard about the heat wave in Canada that absolutely smashed all heat records, at least and in part by four or five degrees, uh, which was even with climate change totally unexpected. And more recently, with Hurricane Otis, which uh, uh, another parameter, the strength of Otis wasn't that surprising. What was surprising was the increase in strength, the very, very fast increase in strength. Uh, normally when we talk, when we talk about hurricanes, there is a process called rapid intensification. Uh, and rapid intensification is normally wind speed uh, in wind speed increases, I think about 35 miles in 12 hours. This hurricane increased by more than 100 miles sustained wind speed in 12 hours. So this was really off the charts, was really off the charts and no one, no one knows why. So uh, there are gaps in our knowledge uh, of extreme weather. Um, which can be attributed to the problem that these models are all a bit different. They get uh, different results. And what people do is they build model ensembles and they build averages over all these models. And normally when we talk about averages and long-term and long scale effects, that's not a problem. But we are talking about rare and unique events that uh, have an effect on fairly small scales normally, like 100 kilometers or so. So uh, the averaging out that the climate, climate ensemble would use uh, makes it a bit harder to discuss or to see unique events. These are all averages, and these averages at times don't give a complete picture, especially uh, in small scale and rare events and so on. So what can we do? That is the last part of, uh, of the attribution science here. Uh, there are storylines, what people are doing today to get around these problems of averages of, uh, of very rare events that are, of course, very rare, even in simulation. So even when you have 200 model runs, you will get one or two very extreme events. And so you have great difficulties to building a statistic. Uh, so what they are saying is forget statistics. What I have said, what uh, the storylines approach does is we take a model and we try to build the most extreme event for a region that we can create. So this is about exploring the edges of plausibility. This is about worst cases. And what they do is they run a model, uh, run a model ensemble. They look at model ones that get a bit more extreme than others. Then they take that model, which is a bit more extreme, take that model and run it over and over again for results that get even more extreme. So, uh, and so on and so on. So they are pushing these models to the limit of what is possible without thinking about probability, about frequency. So normally the attribution approach is 
extremely frequent. We are we are always thinking about oh this happens five times more often than under normal climate conditions. The storylines approach goes the other way. The storyline approach tries to simulate certain events, worst case events, that can happen that are physically plausible because all these morons are physically plausible and tries to find what happens if such an extreme event actually happens. And that's where we get to the question of impact. And it's actually not extreme weather that causes the most casualties. Of course, extreme weather can be very bad, can very, very uh, high, can cause very high casualties and so on. But uh, the most casualties in extreme weather are because of political, uh, social factors, technical factors that uh, societies don't deal appropriately with extreme events. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big thing we need to think about when we think about extreme weather. Weather is just nature happening. What we have to look at is the connection between weather and human life, the impacts of human life, of infrastructure, of social structure on vulnerable populations, on uh, the stability of societies, especially in the global south, uh, the stability of global political order, food supply, and so on. So uh, there's always there's always a question when we look at extreme events. How can we deal with extreme events? What can we do? What should we do? How can we prepare? And what should we be prepared for? For example, there is a. a also pretty recent area of research into holy crisis. That means that in certain regions, in several regions of the globe, like uh, grain exporting region, there may be concurrent extreme weather events event that hit these grain exporting areas at the same, same time in the same year and produce a confluence of some kind of a market shock that has ramifications beyond this extreme weather area, beyond this, uh, this pretty limited uh, weather impact. So this is, this is another thing that can and will happen that, that a climate or a weather event does not just hit one region and then that region is somehow devastated and needs to needs to rebuild or so on. So but uh, extreme weather events will come together, will come together with conflicts, will come together with other market shocks and will have ramifications, very will have consequences in completely different areas. So uh, and that's another active research in impacts. We cannot we cannot just look at an extreme weather locally. So, uh, but when but the first thing we need to look at is the local uh, local impacts. Um, this is a uh, again an ongoing field of science but on the other hand it's it's actually pretty old how can we deal with extreme weather extreme precipitation uh like our city is flooded need do we need higher levees and so and so on but uh when we when we have extreme weather attribution to climate change we can say, okay, such an event happens at that 
frequency, such an event is possible, such an event is likely, we can go ahead and think about it, how, how long and how difficult will this event be? How many people will be affected? What consequences will it have for agriculture? So uh, it's not the bundle of impacts of extreme weather, especially on uh, social factors, on political stability and so on. Uh, it's something we need we need to include into uh, into climate change research. So what I'm uh, well as a as a finish of my lecture, I'd like to uh, present what I think about the topic, uh, because in my view, it's not enough anymore to say okay. We have a bit of disaster preparedness. We have uh, we have the THV, We have the firefighters who come along when the homes are flooded and pump out uh, the basements and so on. We we'll deal with that. So no, we need an integrated approach that takes into account the fact that we will have more frequent extreme weather. That we have a uh, more devastating extreme weather and even completely new extreme weather. So attribution science and knowledge of extreme weather is the start. And from then, from that, we need to go look, how can we prevent such events? I will get to that. The first point is of course, stopping climate change as soon as possible. I, I think that's a no brainer. Uh, climate climate change uh, makes extreme weather worse, so it causes huge damages. So when we think about how can we prevent extreme weather, we need to stop. We need to stop climate change. Unfortunately, climate change is already happening. So even when we go and stop it right now, our carbon emission. If we stop them right now. Uh, we will have to deal with the increased extreme weather with the consequences of climate change for at least a generation before things get better. Because uh, there's, a, there's a sort of lag in the system. So uh, apart from stopping climate change, we have to think about prevention and prevention in this case means thinking about how other human activities impact extreme weather because it's not just climate change. It's also land use. If you think about deforestation, deforestation, for example, uh, has consequences for extreme weather like drought, like heat, because it deprives the earth of uh, of forest cover, it deprives it of water capacity, and when the land surface is wet, contains a lot of water, when it gets heat, water evaporates and takes away energy. Water needs a lot of energy to evaporate, so that energy uh, is not available to heat up the land surface, not available to heat up the air, so when we uh, when we have deforestation, uh, the earth gets hotter, the earth, the air gets heated by the earth and so on. So uh, if we if we have bare earth surface, also in agricultural region, it will make grass worse, it will make heat waves, heat wave worse. Uh, in urbanization, the sealing of surfaces uh, keep uh, rainfall water from uh, from going down into the earth, so you get uh, you get a more water flowing over the surfaces, collecting in channels, uh, collecting collecting in river valleys. And what do you get in river valleys? 
about 80% of all the world's cities. So uh, if, we, if we keep the water from being, uh, from being held back in vegetation in the landscape, we get higher flooding. Flooding is another extreme weather event that is clearly uh, amplified by human activity, not just by climate change, but by land use change. And uh, fires, uh, wildfires, of course, are getting worse because of fire management strategies, because landscapes are not allowed to burn anymore. Uh, so uh, wood accumulates, fuel accumulates, and wildfires are getting worse. So there's a lot of things that we can do aside from dealing with climate change to prevent extreme weather. Uh, preparation, of course, is simple. We need, we need to look at extreme events that can happen. So we build levees, protective arch architecture or for heat wave. There are, for example, a suggestion of greening the roofs and cities and so on. We need to think about that to, to reduce the heat island effect of cities. So that's a, a kind of defensive anti-extreme weather, uh, weather architecture. Um, also, we need to think about changing behavior, change our own behavior, prepare for extreme weather, prepare for that kind of change, and of course, information uh, education. Well, mitigation and extreme event happens, what do we do? Of course, we need emergency services, we need warnings, we need people to be prepared. All this needs to, to be implemented beforehand. We need to get, an, we need to have an integrated approach that doesn't just say, oh, extreme weather can happen. We have some kind of emergency services. No, we have to really think about how we deal with extreme weather. weather. You will remember uh, the Ahrtal flood in the Eifel in Germany, where there was a huge problem for emergency services, for officials and so on, to deal with that event because there was no mindset, there was no preparation for the fact that extreme weather like that, extreme flooding was possible. So this is a matter of mindset. This is not, not so much about, about technology. And afterwards, after an extreme event, event we need to recover. When, uh, once we had a, well, a 200 year flood every 200 years. Okay, people can rebuild in 200 years. People can, can rebuild their livelihood in 200 years. But uh, if we are hit by extreme weather very, very frequently, uh, what happens is that we don't have time to recuperate organically. So we have to think about what happens if we are hit by extreme weather. How do we get back up? So how, how do we prepare ourselves for this recovery? How do we uh, how do we build resilience? How can we make sure that vulnerable populations won't be at the full brunt of this event? So inequality rises. So these are also very important considerations. And at the moment, no one considers all this. And well, what we can do with, with uh, extreme weather also is to think back about climate change. Because when, when we think about climate change, it's just extreme weather writ large. So we have the same challenges, but on a, on a much larger time scale. So we have to adapt to an extreme weather, to an extreme flood, and so on and so on. But we also ha have to adapt in the same way 
to like uh, precipitation changes over the long term. So when we think about extreme weather adaptation, the same principle, the same mindset can help us to prepare for climate change in general, to deal with the long-term effects of climate change. We need to plan, we need to develop this mindset, and we can start with developing a mindset for extreme weather. So, okay, creating a mindset for adaptation. Leveraging technology, this is not about building higher levees, uh, but, but what I'm thinking about is leveraging the predictive power uh, of attribution science, attribution of extreme weather, attribution of the effects, the long-term effects of climate change, with us, which is actually done in research. So people attribute the effects of climate change to climate change. Sounds a bit odd, but uh, if you think about the connection between uh, extreme weather attribution and human impact, it's absolutely the same problem with climate change. So you can go with the same approach here. And uh, computer technology, uh, model technology is a very, very important part of, uh, of being prepared. So, and then what we need to do is preserve, preserving the natural environment because the natural environment protects us from extreme weather, the large part. Be it mangrove that protects uh, coastlines, be it forests that catch water before, the, before it flows into cities, be it vegetation that uh, conserves water to, to lessen the impacts of heat or drought and so on. So uh, the natural environment is our best protection from extreme weather. And the same goes for biodiversity because uh, extreme weather has impact on the natural environment, degrades natural environment, and a diverse environment is more resilient to this degradation. So it's not just protecting the forest, but it's about protecting the forest ecosystem so the forest can actually survive a drought or heat or something like that. And well, the same goes for poverty, for global inequality, because uh, poor populations, vulnerable populations are hit the hardest, they don't have in most cases in the global south, the resilience uh, to deal with increases in food prices and so on. So this is not just about human suffering, but actual stability of the societies, uh, of economy, of technology. And the same goes, of course, on a large scale in our whole world because, uh, well, we can deal with extreme weather, climate change in a productive way here in the global north, but it won't help us if the global south, the countries of the global south collapse into chaos because of, let's say, food prices. And well, that the number one reason for collapsing of society are food prices. So uh, this is a real, real challenge to uh, prevent the global south to, uh, from being hit so badly by climate change, by extreme weather, that these, uh, these societies collapse, collapse into conflict. Um, so in, well, so, so these are the tasks at hand. Uh, so we have come full circle. We need to we need to adapt to extreme weather. We need to adapt to climate change. Uh, the means we can use, uh, the the mindset we can use are in both cases quite the same, and. Uh, 
a lot of challenges await us. They are also the same for both cases. Um, I hope we will meet the challenges before things get out of hand. So thank you for your attention. I apologize for being a bit over time. Uh, are there any questions? Many thanks, Mr. Fisher, for your talk and for introducing us to um, attribution science. And your talk was very timely because yesterday, Federico Otto, a very famous researcher on attribution science, was awarded the Deutsche Umweltpreis, a very uh, prestigious um, honor to get in, in Germany. So uh, it, it is quite some coincidence that you introduced us to attribution science in your talk, and yesterday she got that prize. And also, um, thank you for your call to um, adaptation. I take that with me. Um, one colleague remarked that Federico Otto uh, was awarded that prize yesterday, and uh, we also have some more questions in the chat. I would like to give uh, those questions to you if you have the time, yeah. Um, so very early in your talk, when you talked about the models that compare the old climate model, new climate model, um, one colleague remarked that um, I, I read it now, the, the remark, so far outcomes of various models have been compared to each other. Where do observational data representing the past and current climate come in? That's, uh, that's a very good and very, very important question because uh, I, didn't, I didn't remark on this too much because uh, time was already short, my lecture was already too long, but of course, Data is very crucial for uh, for attribution science. So um, we we calibrate those models with the data we get from the outside, and and uh, this is also the reason why in uh, extreme weather attribution we normally don't use. Uh, the pre-industrial baseline, but the baseline in attribution science is normally between 1980, 2010, or maybe a bit earlier, and that's for exactly that reason, because we need, uh, we need good data, we need detailed data uh, to, to calibrate, to validate the models, um, to find out uh, whether whether they actually capable of reproducing certain events, so that's a very very important point. Unfortunately, we have in general too little data. We always have too little data, um, so then there's always this problem that we are talking about rare events and we don't have good information. Uh, about about how these events actually play out, how frequent they are. So uh, this is a very important point and a very difficult point. Many thanks. Um, before I get to further questions, I would like to ask the people who are still in the call to uh, either send questions into the chat, into the question and answer tool, or to raise their hand so that I can assign uh, speaker rights to you if you would like to ask your question yourself. So I have uh, two, three more questions from the chat and also maybe some questions from the room here will follow as well. So one question from the chat is, uh, a colleague remarked, I don't agree that stopping climate change is a no brainer, as you showed on one slide. People in our government disagree and do not institute the required regulatory changes. And of course, they do so because many voters don't want to change. How do we tackle this? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't actually think uh, 
people in politics and government disagree that uh, something something needs to be done about climate change. The problem in government and generally in politics is that there are many issues and many different interests and many different problems that need to be tackled. And climate change is one that has always been a bit abstract. So uh, it gets pushed to the back or there is a tendency to try to, to compromise with climate change to meet somewhere in the middle, like you could negotiate with nature, because in politics, it's always, in democratic politics, it's always on, about finding compromises and uh, find, find middle ground between certain interests. So uh, if we have a situation like climate change, that needs to be stopped as soon as possible, no matter what. Uh, politics is ill-suited to deal with such a situation because politics is rightly, that's rightly so. Democratic politics has to be about compromise on middle and middle ground. But in such a situation, this is actually very harmful. Right. One more question that is actually two questions. The first part is how has climate change research changed over the past years? And the second part is and how do you deal with climate change deniers? So it's two part question. First, how has climate change research changed? And the second, how do you deal with climate change deniers? Okay, the first part. Um... No, and there are several trends, of course. Uh, models have become much better. Uh, data collection has become much better. Uh, so we have a much better picture of what's going on uh, in the natural environment, in the climate. There have been huge advances about uh, the parts of the climate system that were the, were controversial only 20 years ago. There have been advances in the question of clouds, for example. Uh, there have been advances in uh, how the ocean reacts and so on. So uh, we know a lot more about uh, the components of the climate system, how they interact, uh, what parts I play in the natural environment. Also, uh, we actually see climate change in action. We can see, for example, the stratosphere cooling. We can see uh, the subtropical belt expanding northward and southward. So we, when 30 years ago, we had a number of predictions and so on. Now we can see actual effects. Now we can see, for example, extreme weather like never, uh, no one ever predicted before. So uh, we can actually observe. We are testing the climate system to destruction. So we are actually hacking. We are actually hacking the climate system and learning a lot about it. Uh, on one hand, of course, it's a, a good thing. On the other hand, testing to destruction is a very bad thing. Uh, uh, second, uh, second very important impact is paleoclimate. We know a lot more about past climate changes, about past climate effects uh, than we did before. So we can compare uh, today's situation with what happened in past episodes in Earth history. Uh, and spoiler, it looks, it doesn't look good because what we are doing today looks a lot worse than even the worst episode of climate change in Earth history uh, in, in certain respects. And the third part, of course, is attribution science. 
uh, and the connection between climate change, stream weather, and human impact. That's what we uh, know a lot more about this. But, uh, well, I'm a journalist. I have a pretty narrow perspective. So that's a question uh, that the climate change uh, scientist could answer better, I think. And the second part, climate, climate deniers. I, I don't discuss with them because it, it doesn't pay off. People who are still in the camp of, well, there's uh, no climate change or climate change is not harmful or not dangerous. Uh, they are willfully ignorant. They are trying to, to steal my time, to sap my energy. Uh, they go straight, well, they go straight into the race bin because it's not worth engaging with them. They are false. They are just false. I have one last question before I go to the round in, in the room. That is, um, you mentioned that we try to simulate with current climate models to go to the extremes. Do you see a model that is able to predict a tropical storm that goes into hurricane number level five within 12 hours? Or do you see a model that could have predicted the precipitation in, in Greece or in Tunisia that we saw or Libya? Or do you see um, a climate model that we can go to the extremes that predicts the heat waves that we saw in the US or in Canada? Are our current climate models able to, to come to such results? Yes. Uh, of course, you should, you should ask that. You should uh, give a question to the scientists who actually work in that field. Uh, because uh, this storylining of the climate of certain climate events is really, really novel. But one of the events you mentioned, the uh, heat wave in Canada, was actually storylined that way. And uh, together with other heat waves, two other heat waves in Chicago and Paris. So uh, it actually possible with this approach called ensemble boosting in which you you push you push a climate model further and further and further up without using physical uh, plausibility it is absolutely possible to model these extreme events but if you go to classical approach you run the model in a statistical way uh, these events are apparently so well that I don't occur. Okay, now to question here in the room. I would have three remarks and set of questions maybe to some of the discussions before to make a the connection there. Um, there was one thing like uh, you said just about the politicians, they don't care and they have there are multiple interests. There was a good example today, uh, which starts in the news or the, the last week, that uh, the European solar industry is heavily, so who are on the, let's in quote say, uh, pro change side of the discussion, they are heavily claiming about uh, cheap Chinese solar panels are destroying the industry. So it's even an over swapping of this of the interests back to the other side, so that can happen a lot. Maybe we should just extract the good news. Solar gets incredibly cheap. Yeah, but uh, rather the, the the problem the problem here is that it's absolutely legitimate to to be concerned, for example, about the economy, about about social issues besides climate change and so on. Our politics is not just about fighting climate change. Of course, climate change is a very pressing issue that is, is dealt very badly by today's politics. But uh, everyday politics has so much to do and so much to deal with that you can 
Now you can say uh, politicians don't care. Uh, politicians care very much about a lot of things. And that's part of the problem, actually, because in a modern society, there's so much to care about that it's important, that it's vitally important. So uh, that, that's really a problem. That's, that's not, it's not because uh, there's, there's uh, like, like a conspiracy of ignorance in politics, because uh, there is really, really an issue uh, about allocating resources and so on. Many thanks. Yeah, please. Yes. Maybe I last year I um, read a lot about this weakening of the jet stream, right? It's the jet stream is kind of meandering or so, and that this was try they tried to explain these long enduring heat periods with these. Yeah, the unders of the gesture. Do you know, is this considered by the climate models which you were talking about, which are used for attribution? Uh, this is, uh, again, a field of ongoing research. Um, the connection between jet stream and climate change uh, is a very, very important topic. It's debated for, that's been debated for the last 15 years. If whether this is actually true, if the models can show that, if measurements can show that. So it's not entirely clear what the connection between jet stream and, and uh, climate change is, but it's at least plausible that this is in fact happens, that this meandering of the jet stream increases because of climate change. Um, so that there is actually an example, not not with a jet stream, but the general effect of uh, changes in the global circulation impacting weather because uh, beyond what uh, just global warming would predict. There was a, there was heavy rainfall and flooding, I think, in East Africa, and. Uh, they found not just that uh, this extreme flooding was, uh, I think, a hundred times or so more likely because of climate change, but they found also that in the model, it was much more likely, uh, about 80 times more likely than it would have been just because of warming, just because of the increased moisture, because of warming. And because of that discrepancy uh, in the likelihood, they, con they concluded that it was not just moisture content of, in the atmosphere that increased rainfall and caused the flooding, but it was changes in global circulation. So uh, extreme weather attribution catches these global circulation effects. I don't have an example uh, where it actually is a jet stream, but in general, global circulation uh, is uh, at the center of the issue, yes. So there are no more obvious questions. Um, I would like to stop the recording of that session. I have an extra bonus question, maybe. Yes, please. If, if, if there's enough time, I guess. Uh, so um, I wrote down something about the sea temperatures, um, which have been risen quite fast than to expected uh, behaviors and, and to, uh, to, to what they expected in models. So and the, the sea temperature as such is not a weather phenomenon. It's rather the source that causes further um, things in the weather. And for the models that we've seen and what we're calculating with, um, do they already incorporate this uh, added sea level temperature rise, or will everything be even worse than calculated? Uh, that's a difficult question because no one actually knows where all the heat is coming from. So, uh, well, the, the oceans are much hotter than they should be, maybe. But this interaction between atmosphere heating and the ocean 
is still very open, very controversial because uh, the heat capacity of the oceans are so large. The oceans themselves are so large and so intransparent that we don't know very well where the heat is going and why it's coming up back and if this state is just an exception or uh, if it will persist. So these are still open questions and of course very important questions. Uh, but uh, if this heat content, heat transmission into the atmosphere persists, of course that we have huge impact of climate, on climate models. Yeah, thank you. Many thanks. So also thank you a lot for the question and answer session. And I will stop the recording and maybe we will have some um, one on one discussions here in the room or you all leave. Yeah. Many thanks again.